In today's interview, we're going to be talking about housing and homelessness and uh, what that intersection looks like and how to kind of find the crossroads of housing, social services, self-sufficiency practices, and how to put all that into motion. And the person that's going to help us do that is Steve Pontel. Steve is the president and CEO of the National Community Renaissance. He's the founder of the La Jolla Institute, and he's a chairman of the BizFed Institute. Steve has been really instrumental from finding out-of-the-box innovative solutions and putting those into practice. So excited to be talking with him today, and I think you're going to love this interview. So today we have Steve Pontel with us. Uh, really excited to have you. Um, before we get into the meat of what you do, which is really incredible, a um, couple things. You grew up in Big Pear, and I love the mountains. Um, and you wanted to be an architect and ran away when you started drafting. <laughs> um, and I also, I Three ended up, minutes. I know everything. I do my homework. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I, I found that interesting because I wanted to be an architect. And once I realized the workload that was involved, I ended up shooting architecture instead. Uh, and that's a whole nother story. But anyways, uh, it was good to see those, those things in your background there. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah, I think it was after my 50th bathroom detail, I thought, I can't do this for the rest of my life. So, And there are so few architects that are the, really the master designers. True. So it worked out well becoming a city planner. Well, obviously, and now uh, being the president and CEO of CORE, uh, National Community Renaissance, um, you know, I, I want to dive in on that, obviously, and you're also you know, the chairman of the BizFed Institute. Uh, you founded the La Jolla Institute, and, you know, you're, you're, you're very active in the housing and homelessness space and about affordable uh, development. And I'd like to get into, uh, if you don't mind, just jumping right in. Um, sure. First, kind of, I want to talk about housing in a general sense. Um, when you think of affordable housing, I think people tend to, I don't know if they realize it or not, but I think a lot of times with affordable housing, people get boxed in. And I think the system is designed to kind of keep them in affordable housing. And I've, I, I have friends too who have gone through this where they've had opportunities and chose not to take those opportunities because they would get pushed out of the affordable housing and then couldn't afford what, you know, they were kind of in that flux where they wanted to progress, but if they did, they'd lose their housing and then get priced out of their, their town. Um, it sounds like you found a solution to that. Can you talk about housing in general and how you're looking at that differently? Yeah, and, and it's, it's absolutely the case that the system, uh, unfortunately, is somewhat distorted with regard to its incentives. So, but, but first of all, I'll take a step back. Um, you know, the context of the issue is the affordability of housing. And the bigger the delta is between, say, median income housing, what people can afford, um, and subsidized housing, then the bigger the challenge to make the transition. And so, you know, the challenge we have in California specifically is that the affordability of housing is so skewed um, that a vast majority of the population cannot afford a median price of tax. Mm -hmm. And so what happens is once you get into a subsidized unit, you know, depending on your income, to take the step out of the subsidy into a market rate unit is going to be bigger than any economic advantage that you could probably come by. So just for example, you know, uh, a two-bedroom, one, one of our units uh, for a two-bedroom, four-person family, say at 60% of the median income, you know, their rent in one of our properties might be $1,000, $1,100 a month. A comparable market rate unit in the same market would probably be $2,200, $2,300 a month. Yeah. And so to be able to, you're not going to get a raise big enough to take your income to the point where you can afford an extra $1,000 a month. And so that, that becomes the trap. And you, you hear a lot of it about the missing middle and just that growing gap is something that we really have to pay a lot of attention to. So what we try and do is, you know, one of our missions as an organization is we want to help people out and we want to help them out of our property. And so we, you know, it's, it's interesting because there's no incentive for us to do that. You know, most multifamily property managers want to keep residents as long as possible because turns cost money. So you want to keep people as long as you can. But we view it as our mission since we have thousands and thousands of people on our wait list 
anything we can do to help a family move out. Um, and, and it often is into home ownership. And so, you know, we offer a lot of counseling, a lot of budgeting, you know, a lot of planning to help people start making moves and saving and thinking about what their alternatives are. Um, get a mindset that can is willing to take that risk step because it is a risk step and um, and then help people move out. You know, the, the dynamic tends to be, and this is just the nature of Southern California, you know, if somebody's renting one of our units in, you know, West Covina or Pasadena or whatever the case is, they probably have to go further east to be able to buy a house, but that opportunity exists you know, as we coach people towards, you know, reviewing what those options. And so that, you know, we think about that a lot and we think it's really important that people have a plan um, because otherwise they'll stay in one of our units for a very long time. Yeah. And I, you know, I think it's important to make sure, like, I, I want to pull out the fact that, you know, a lot of solutions end up being topical and like band-aid solutions. And, I love, I really admire what you guys are doing with the whole develop, build, manage, serve. The fact that you're looking at this as a long-term, almost like a legacy project, that you're not just there to provide housing as, as the only step, which I think happens a lot, um, but that you want to empower people to get out of the predicament they're in and that you're, you're actually helping the social fabric around the housing condition. Is anybody else doing that um, in your space? And, and how did you... How did you get to that point? Like, how did you, how did you kind of break out of, like you said, there's no incentives. There's no reason for a lot of developers to do that. What, what made you want to do that? Yeah. So the, the history and a lot of the, our fellow affordable housers will tend to focus on the children uh, with quote unquote, breaking the cycle of poverty. And so helping children develop the mindset and the skills and abilities to be able to want to move on and move out and we've had a lot of success with that so we have lots of those stories where kids going to college and kids you know achieving a certain amount of excellence um, the other side of that when i first came about eight years ago one of our properties family was having a party where the granddaughter had just qualified for a unit in the same property where her mom had a unit and her grandma had a unit and so they considered that a major win and so breaking those multi-generational patterns is something that has always been pretty important for our organization and a lot of people in this particular space. Um, but it, you know, it kind of goes back to there's no mechanism or incentive or encouragement for us to break the current family's tie um, to the unit. And so when you look at the different funding sources, they'll encourage you to do an after-school program but they're not going to encourage you to do any kind of counseling, you know, any kind of help with families from an economic self-sufficiency standpoint. Now, we have a lot of partners that help with this. So some of the financial institutions, you know, banks and credit unions and other organizations um, that do have an interest in people stabilizing their finances. Um, you know, one of the challenges that we have is probably 60% of our families don't have checking accounts. So mm. they use, you know, check cashing stores. And so one of the challenges I threw out to my team is, look, either we figure out how to fix that or we open check cashing stores in all of our lobbies. Hmm. But the issue is, you know, how, how do we help people understand? And most of them don't have checking accounts, not because they don't know the benefit of it, but because they have in the past abused a checking account, so they no longer qualify to have them. Gotcha. And so how do we help rebuild that? How do we help, you know, put them on the right path? And, you know, I think it's just came... You know, my philosophy is, you know, it's all about the people and we want to help people have the most opportunity that they can have. And, you know, with that philosophy, you're going to look at things through a lens on absolutely want them to have a quality environment. We want to have this safe environment, we want their kids to have access to programs, but we also want those families to be aspirational and move forward. And then, you know, there are always going to be a certain percentage of families that once they get the, the, they win the lottery, so to speak, and they have now a subsidized housing unit, they're going to manage their life to stay within that subsidy. And that's fine. Um, but, you know, we have 9,000 units. And so I said, look, if we just did 5% of our units, that'd be 450 families moving out into either their home ownership or other market rate opportunities. And that's not a bad thing. And yeah. so we're continuing to push along those lines. Great. Um, I, wa I want to talk about homelessness, um, but 
be, before I do, um, before I get off the, the subject of housing, um, can you talk a little bit about the services specifically that you offer in these communities and how, because from, you know, what I've seen with what you do, it feels like, uh, I, I, don't, I don't know the, the appropriate word for it, but almost like a, like a commune mentality. Like, I feel like everybody's kind of pitching in and being a part of this, um, whether that's education or whether that's, I think you have financial literacy as a part of your services. Um, can you talk about what, what that looks like? Yeah. So it, it, there's, a, there's a significant continuum because the housing that we provide um, meets um, a lot of different populations. And so, so on the first side, one of the things we're very proud of is when we build a project, um, nobody can tell the difference between one of our properties and a market rate property. And so kind of what you were alluding to earlier, people have perceptions of affordable housing and the perception is usually not positive. Yep. And so one of our challenges in getting projects entitled is often the neighborhood not wanting, quote unquote, those people in our neighborhood. A hundred percent of the time, once the project's built and the people are living there, the neighborhoods are very content and satisfied because we add value, add quality, because we not only build, but we also manage the properties and we own them for the long term. And so it's in our interest as an organization to build them well and manage them well and create a quality environment. We also feel that it's important that people's self-esteem is built by the quality of the environment within which they live. And so if you, I don't know if you've had a chance, but if you're at all interested, happy to you know, tour any of our properties, um, you, you would be comfortable living in any of our properties. And you know, that dynamic is one of our core values as an organization. And then once you're living there, we want to make sure that you have access to appropriate amenities. And so you're going to find amenities very similar to most market rate properties, you know, whether it's you know, exercise facilities, swimming pool, play areas, dog parks, you know, all of that gets built into our properties as well. And so that once again, people are living in a very quality environment. But then the programming side of the equation through our Hope Through Housing Foundation, we, do, we have three major areas. Number one, we pay a lot of attention to the kids. So after school programs are very important to us. Um, we struggled a little bit, but we've had some really good breakthroughs you know, over the last year or so on, on teenagers. So kids, you know, the teenage years tend to be a little bit challenging for us to try and engage them. We have a partnership with Health Corps. Um, Health Corps is a program designed for high schools that focuses on fitness, uh, nutrition, and resiliency. And so we're the first affordable houser to have a health core worker working with our teenagers on our properties and our teenagers have responded very well to that. And so we, we think a lot about how to meet different age groups. And then for families, our economic mobility, family self-sufficiency, the financial counseling work we do with them, um, we have a lot of families respond very positively to that. And then we have all the other things throughout the course of the year. So whether it's Christmas and Thanksgiving and back to school. And so throughout the course of the year, there's a steady stream of programming um, tied to what people are going through. And then the, the other focus we have is um, our senior properties, senior wellness. And so we focus a lot on uh, the quality of life of people living in our senior properties. And a lot of that has to do with isolation. Mm -hmm. um, you know, 50, we've done surveys in the past where up to 50% of people living in senior properties are clinically depressed and a lot of them have been abandoned by their families. And so we do a lot to engage them, get them out of their units and, and bring in nursing students to lead fitness programs. We bring in dentists, we bring in people to, you know, help, you know, manage their diet and, and make sure they have adequate food. You know, one of the things that's happened to us during the, the, COVID-19 is a lot of our programming has been shut down because our community centers are shut down. A lot of the group programs are shut down and we've shifted to being a feeding organization where we're probably feeding about 3000 families a week right now. Many of them senior families that would not be eating if we weren't helping to provide food. And so is that's that community we, wide. Sorry. Is it, is that community wide or is that within the property? Uh, mostly within the property, a little bit outside of the property. We partner with a lot of community organizations that provide the food, um, a lot of faith-based organizations we have some very strong relationships with. And so most of it has been focused for people living on the properties. 
Okay. And I'd be happy to share with you, you know, some of the pictures and we've had a, you know, some videos. I mean, there's nothing quite like the joy of, uh, of uh, providing food to seniors and just how appreciative they are. But on the community side, actually, we have properties in uh, Panorama City, Van Nuys, and tomorrow we're actually doing a neighborhood feeding project in that neighborhood um, uh, in addition to our residents. And so there, there is some of the both. It's great. But it does, it, it, we try and be as comprehensive as possible in thinking about the quality of the physical environment and the quality of the programming and thinking about the long-term you know, quality of life for the families. I love it. No, it's so admirable. And it's also... Um, and I'm sure like being a nonprofit probably helps as well, where you can stay closer to mission. Um, obviously you need to worry about the bottom line as well. Um, but I think, th does that help you being a nonprofit that you can really stay focused on the impact that you're creating? Yeah. Um, you know, we compete with for-profits and there are for-profits that have, nonprofit affiliates. So I don't want to say, you know, for profits are completely, you know, mercenary in their relationship yeah. with their community. Th thank you for clarifying. And I and I don't mean that either. Um and I'm not trying to, you know, stomp on on the industry as a whole by any moon means. I just think it's a heavy lift with the, what you're doing. And by touching that from childhood to senior and all the services and all the things and resources that go into doing that, it's it's not a small feat. Um, so I think a lot of people can be swayed away from mission sometimes and worry about the bottom line because it's important. Um, so that's all. My, my point is just yeah. that I, I'm wondering if that's why you guys are so sharp on, on what you're doing here. Yeah, it certainly helps. And so our two foundations are, you know, participating in the transformation of the lives of our residents and the neighborhoods that we're in. And so both halves of those equations are things that we're committed to. So when we build a project in a neighborhood, we do pay attention to the entire neighborhood. Our community centers are open to the entire neighborhood. You know, years ago, we made this shift where most multifamily properties will put the community center in the middle of the property in order to protect it from the neighborhood. We put all of our community centers on the edge of our properties so that the neighborhood can come in and participate in the programming that we have going on as well. And so we're very committed to both sides of those equations. You know, increasingly we're, we're positioning ourselves and moving ourselves to be more of a community developer, of which housing is a significant part, but we really care about the community as a whole. As far as we know, we're the only affordable housing that actually has a planning department within our organization. So we can do housing elements and specific plans and work with cities or really, you know, how, how do we transform these neighborhoods? And that's all about our mission. I mean, and so, you know, one of the things that I enjoy is being a nonprofit with this platform. We have the flexibility to get creative, get engaged, and participate, you know, more than if we were just project by project by project oriented. Yeah. And reinventing the region. Um, from what you've just discussed, uh, obviously that's a part of it. How else do you envision how to reinvent our region? So, um, so there's two halves to that. There, there's what we normally do without the virus. And then one of the conversations we've been facilitating because of the virus. And so we, um, it is often the case that we are the only affordable housing engaged in certain conversations, especially early on. So six years ago, we started pushing really hard the health and housing connection. And so there, there's a couple of kind of philosophical perspectives I have. One is we've got to figure out how to bridge the silos that have rationally grown, or I think we call them towers of excellence now. Hmm. And the, because the walls are thick and they're really tall, but the issues are really complicated. So water people don't have time to talk to transportation people, and transportation people don't have time to talk to housing people. Housing people don't have time to talk to education people, education people don't have time to talk to help people, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. And so what we try and do is we try and think systemic, systemically and how do we bring all those silos together when we're engaging in 
a community transformation. And so when we're working on a specific project, we reach out to education, health, the business community, and the faith community, just as our normal course of conversation to bring them into, okay, what, what needs to be done within this context and how do we work together? And we've, we've begun to have more and more success getting the health community understanding, you know, obviously they've understood the critical role housing pay, plays as a social determinant of health. But where they've been struggling is, okay, what do we do about how we're health people? What do we do about housing? And so we've had some success getting help to actually invest in some of our housing projects. And we're continuing to move down that, those paths. So we Dignity Health invested in a project we're doing in San Bernardino. Um, the Inland Empire Health Plan, which is the Medicaid, Medicare payer in the Inland Empire, invested in a project in Rancho Cucamonga. We're working with Kaiser and Providence Health and others to really put together those kinds of partnerships. Um, same thing with education, working closely with school districts and others on development of housing for teachers. You know, I think California has, is it 180,000 or whatever the number is, quote unquote, um, unstably housed children. I know San Bernardino City Schools alone has 5,000 children that are unstably housed, which means they're living in a motel, living in a car, couch surfing, whatever it is. You know, so that makes education really hard. Yeah. And it just goes, it similarly shows, you know, what an important role housing plays in education. And so we continue to figure out how do we bring these things together in order to solve problems collectively. When the virus hit, you know, the thing that really struck me was, you know, lots of conversations about how to survive the virus, growing conversations about how to revive the economy, but not a lot about how to create resilient communities that can thrive into the future. Mm -hmm. And so we began to convene conversations among all of these silos to say, look, there's a window of opportunity right now with the fabric of our communities being completely shaken to say, okay, what, what's not working now that was not working before that now is a unique opportunity to change. And so we're working with a whole variety of people out of public health and healthcare on um, education, you know, economic development, uh, et cetera, et cetera, in order to try and, and zone in on how can we reinvent, you know, a critical aspect of this region um, because of the current challenges. And, you know, we've started to zero in on a couple of things around, you know, the digital divide and telehealth, teleeducation, telework, et cetera. You know, what, what's the benefits? What are the challenges? You know, how do we begin to address some of that? you know, among a number of other conversations. Is that part of the SoCal transformation or is that part of CORE? Now that's what, you know, is branded as SoCal transformation. And what's been fun is every single person that we've talked to about it has said, yes, what can we do? How can we do it? And um, it's also been fun to get Southern California as a whole to potentially work together. Um, San Diego is part of Southern California, even though they often like to be separate. <laughs> and so we've had tremendous success bringing the whole region together to begin to think about, okay, what should we do? What can we do now um, that will make the region better in the long run? And we'll yeah. see what comes out of it. Great. Um, I want to talk about homelessness um, for a little bit here. It's a really tricky conversation. And you know, we're a national platform and, and the issue is different in each state. Obviously, us being in Southern California, I think it's more uh, in it's woven into our everyday lives. Um, can you erase some of the stigma of, of homelessness and talk a little bit about the cycle? Um, I want to talk about obviously some of the solutions and your thoughts on that. But can you walk us through um, kind of what starts this process and how it gets exasperated and where are some of the missteps maybe along the way um, before we get to how, to how to find solutions for this. The biggest single challenge we have is um, the sources, the original sources of homeless. And so if you know that 80% of foster kids are going to end up homeless, let's address it. Because the challenge we have is once somebody's on the streets, the, the, what it takes to survive on the streets and the challenges of living on the streets, by definition, create a cycle that make it more and more difficult over time to break, to get off the streets. 
And so one of the biggest challenges is let's turn off the spigot and then begin to go downstream and address the most serious of the issues on the property. And so if you look at foster kids, if you look at recently incarcerated, um, you know, if you look at uh, uh, the challenges around employment and unemployment, you know, if you, if you look at domestic violence, if you look at, I mean, we know the primary causes, you know, some of which is mental health, some of which is substance abuse, but often you'll see the substance abuse and mental health issues exacerbated by people the longer they're on the streets. And so if the issues have been addressed at the front end of the problem, the resources necessary to, to solve it on the back end of the problem or after a few years of living on the streets would be significantly less. And so that, that's the dynamic to get our minds around. You know, and there's some fundamental you know, uh, uh, you know, aspects of our society. You know, it was in the 1960s-ish where family responsibility was severed. You know, whereas prior to that, if there was a family member that could take care of a family member, then the family had the primary responsibility to take care of a fellow family. Mm -hmm. And so that got severed in the 60s. And then when the... Uh, was, it, was there an inciting moment for that or what caused that? Yeah, it, it was part of it. To be honest, I'd have to go back and I used to know this actually, <laughs> but it was, it was a piece of federal legislation that essentially you know, where it was some level of welfare that's, that it no longer became a criteria of having a fellow family member that can take care of you before you could qualify for this government assistance. Um, interesting, there are still many countries around the world that still have that requirement, where, you know, in Korea, if you have a family member that can take care of you, you do not qualify for government assistance. And so, you know, there are, there's the family fabric you know, in Italy, the family has primary responsibility for taking care of fellow families. Uh, an exacerbation of the problem was when, you know, a lot of the mental health facilities, residential mental health facilities were shut down and no longer funded. Because there are people that have certain mental health issues where family can't, that is, is not equipped to take care of them. And so there is an institutional need for some level of professional care that's required. And so that began to put additional stress on families where, you know, if things got bad enough, families just didn't have the, were not equipped to be able to deal with whatever the family member was dealing with. And so all of these things have contributed to, you know, what's then happening on the streets today. And so, and, you know, the other critical part of it is just the flat, the affordability of housing, where one minor disruption causes somebody to be homeless you know, starting out in a motel, ending up in their car, ending up, you know, and that cycle, the longer it goes on, the more difficult it is to break. Yeah. And so in, you know, using California, you know, I view the homeless as kind of the tip of the iceberg because the real iceberg is the massive overcrowding we have within our existing housing units. And so that overcrowding is something that, you know, you're one argument away from being kicked out of somebody else's house. And that, and you know, it's going to be fascinating to see the studies that come out on the virus spread. Yeah. And one of the, you know, Los Angeles County is one of the densest county, if not the densest county in the nation. And it's density not by design. It's density because of overcrowding. And that overcrowding is not good if you're trying in any kind of a public health sense. And so that's a dynamic that is a huge contributor to, you know, the challenges we have. And just understanding the public health issues associated with overcrowding and then exacerbated by homelessness is, I think, a big wake-up call that we'll hopefully have. Just real quickly, you know, one of the big challenges in, in a, a lot of other parts of the country is just the quality of the housing stock is not being kept up because the market, you know, the, there are not market forces inspiring investment in units. So you have people living in very poor quality housing stock that is, you know, one step above homeless, but it's still not a healthy environment within which to live. And I think there was this one study about, you know, a certain percentage of housing units, the environmental quality inside is much worse than the environmental quality outside. Mm -hmm. And so you just kind of understanding all of those dynamics coming to bear, and it has to do with a lack of investment in the housing needs of our society 
and not viewing housing and the critical role it's, it plays in so many other aspects of what we do. Yeah, and I'm glad you brought up the impact of COVID on all of this as well, because that definitely adds another um, complication to the whole process here. And, you know, we've talked to people in this series about domestic violence being at a spike and abuse and how people with addiction are, are dealing with this. Um, and I don't think you, most people probably don't think about housing and homelessness in that same light, but it's it's very similar. And I think there's a lot of pain points there um, that share a similar narrative. Um, there was recently, I know a federal judge mandated that LA had to um, shelter uh, six to 7,000 homeless people within Los Angeles County. Um, how Has that affected you guys at all? Or are you part of the solution for that? Or is that unrelated? No, we're, yeah, we're, we're working on it. And, you know, the, um, you know, obviously there are a lot of motel rooms that have been rented and there are some homeless that have been able to make the transition into that. Um, but it's not easy. So we just opened a new property in San Diego that's for chronically homeless. And it takes a lot of care moving somebody out of a chronically homeless situation, especially when they've been homeless for a number of years, into you know, living in a, in a structured environment. And, um, and I think that's one of the challenges that's being managed right now is to just try and do it quickly is very, very difficult. Yeah. And so I think, um, you know, it's going to be interesting to see how it plays out. What we're trying to work on is, okay, once the crisis is over and the motel rooms are no longer available, where are the people going to go? Um, because a lot of motels cannot be converted into permanent housing. Yeah. Um, they just structurally, it's not possible or the costs are just outrageous. And so we're looking at a variety of alternatives to try and brainstorm, okay, what can be done? You know, what might that look like? And, um, you know, the biggest challenge we have is the basic math shows you the amount of money necessary to produce subsidized housing is hundreds of billions of dollars mm -hmm. in just in Southern California, let alone wow. nationwide. The money doesn't exist at the scale necessary to solve the problem. So we really have to shift our thinking to think about, you know, what's known as NOAA, naturally occurring affordable housing. You know, what are other solutions that the market can bring to bear where that would be cost effective to be able to provide shelter? And what are policy changes necessary in order to let those solutions be pursued? And so that's some of the challenge I think that we as a society are facing right now is we have preconceived notions, federal rules about what's a dwelling, what does it have to include, yeah. what's the size, what are the amenities, et cetera. And, um, and maybe there needs to be more flexibility. Well, there, there definitely needs to be more flexibility, especially if we really are serious about getting people off the streets into what would be a continuum of housing solutions. Yeah. Um, and Garcetti, I forgot what his exact response was, but it was similar to what you said, where, great, this is an opportunity now for us to kind of work together and try to figure this out. It was very work in progress. We're learning on the job. This is new to us. This is, you know, it, it wasn't a cookie cutter response. It was very human and I, and I appreciated it. And that was very similar to what you just said. Um, well, I, I, mean, want there's a, I would just say there's an interesting story. So one of my board members is a former federal judge. And he was the federal judge in Riverside County when the Duraville, there was a mobile home community known as Duraville on Native American property that was very unsafe and unsanitary and unregulated. And so the U.S. attorney came in and said, hey, we need to shut this down. And the judge said, okay, that's fine. I agree. Where are the people going to go? And the U.S. attorney's response was, not my job. And the judge says, look, I'm not going to have some trail of tears on my watch. Good. You guys have got to find a place for them to go. Forcing the federal government, the state government, and the county to work together to come up with solutions. And they did. And so sometimes maybe that kind of external yeah. impetus can force us to work together when <sighs> the normal course of events would not. And that, I mean, that's coronavirus in a nutshell. I mean, it's forced exactly. us all to really figure out how to become a community again. Um, and, and I wanted to ask you about that too. Like, 
is there, does community lead lead to innovation? Um, do you see the connection being a part of innovative ideas? And, you know, now that we're all coming together in different ways, like, you know, and having conversations like this, like, is, is this kind of a positive sign for the future? Yeah, I'm hopeful, but <laughs> um, I'm a, so, you know, I feel as if there's a window of opportunity, you know, and it's kind of like after an earthquake and there's liquefaction, everything's liquid until it firms up again. But I already feel things firming up again. And the opportunity for dramatic change is starting to diminish. So if there is going to be change, speed matters. I mean, we got to move really fast yep. because the human nature is to want to go back to the way it was. Yeah. Well, you want, you want that warm hug. <laughs> exactly. And, and, but the way it was, wasn't all that great no. you know, to a large extent. <laughs> and so that's why it's like, okay, wait, 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 you know, let's think about it. But the entrenched self-interest are just that. And so breaking that is, is really hard. And so, you know, there are some structural fractures, like the fiscal structure of local government is completely trashed right now. Mm -hmm. And so that may give us some opportunities for change and, you know, thoughtful innovation. So I'm hopeful and I'm going to push as hard as I possibly can to get some stuff, you know, changed and implemented while there's this window of opportunity and people are more flexible than they ever were. You know, it's, it's kind of like the whole, you know, federal government paying for telework. They said they would never do it. The virus hits within two weeks, they're doing it. And all of a sudden it's their telehealth. And now the likelihood of them going back and not paying for it in the future is very slim. So we had a significant breakthrough where telehealth, which can be significantly more effective, more accessible in a whole variety of ways, I think can be a, a really positive permanent change if we can get the people that have the biggest need, the tools they need to really access, you know, have, you know, an FQHCs right now, uh, fed federally qualified health systems. I think it's um, half of the calls are telephonic because they don't have a video device to have a video visit, which is more effective. So how do we get people those devices to be able to have full access to that? So those kinds of windows of opportunities, I think they still exist. But I do feel the ground firming yeah. up around and people kind of locking in again. And so I'm, I'm hopeful, but we got to move fast. Yeah, I agree um, for sure. And I, I think that I, I'm feeling that too. I think everybody is to an extent. Um, and there's a, there's a certain feeling of like restlessness about that as well, I think. Um, so to, and to your point of like local government, you know, local governments tend to be woefully underfunded and, you know, sometimes underprepared for things uh, because they don't have the resources the federal government has. But at the same time, this virus has also made us more in tune to our local surroundings, our community and our local government where, you know, we're looking at mayors and governors for their leadership. Now we're looking at what's my state, my city, my town doing, cause I need to know. And I haven't seen that in a long time. Um, so to your point of, op, you know, that window of opportunity, um, I think it could reshape the way local government runs, um, but they do need resources obviously as well. So I think there's, that's, that's probably a whole nother conversation. Um, yeah. I, this will, I mean, I'm hopeful on that again, and I think you'll see it in certain places, but in other places, you know, change is still hard yeah. and without the right leader, we may not get the change that we really could have otherwise. So how, how do we do that? How do we find those leaders? How do those leaders come out of this? Like, how do you find leadership in COVID? I have no idea. That's a great question. Yeah. <laughs> but I'm so asking I, a leader, come on. Yeah, so I, I, think, I think what it is, is it rises to the top and when you find it, support it. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, that, that would be, you know, um, um, you know, Nick Maccioni, the public health officer in San Diego is, you know, doing some really interesting things. And so, you know, understanding what he's doing, getting behind him and supporting it. Um, you know, I think you see it on both the public side and on the private side, you know, where, you know, various institutions are really trying to figure out how to, you know, how to, um, 
um, you know, reinvent and move things forward at this point. You know, one of the things I used to say in speeches, you know, how many people ever go to a planning commission meeting or a city council yeah. meeting? Um, now more than ever, pay attention to what's going on. And when you see something happen, support it. Because the people that are opposed to things always show up in force. And so, you know, know what's going on in your city, understand, you know, you know, what's possible and then support those people that seem to be willing to step up and make changes and, you know, and want to make things happen right now. So I, I would scan, find somebody that you can support and then get engaged and support. Love that. I was going to ask you how we can, um, we, your advice for getting young people involved and knowledgeable about, about housing and homelessness and other issues that affect their community. Um, it sounds like you just gave that answer, but is there, um, anything else, um, and, and specific to our demographic, which is primarily younger? Yeah. I mean, I, I think the most important thing and the biggest opportunity is really know the facts, know the numbers. Um, just like I said before, know the sources, you know, don't view the homeless as a, you know, homogeneous population. That's all, you know, coming from one, but really kind of understand the dynamic and then pick something specific that you can sink your teeth into. And so for young people, one of the ones that might be easiest is foster kids. You know, I think it is unconscionable on our side as a society that we allow 80% of foster kids to end up homeless. I mean, that is just absolutely ridiculous yeah. and completely unnecessary. And so, you know, pick something like that or, you know, whatever population you may be concerned about um, and then find an organization or an individual that you can get engaged with to really have a meaningful involvement in something specific. And when you do that, you'll increasingly begin to learn the process and the opportunity for change. You know, right now, the developmentally disabled, there, there's a, you know, there are organizations where the developmentally disabled would go to work and, you know, they would work in a whole variety of different ways. And the work was mostly socialization. Mm -hmm. And, um, but companies would contract and then, you know, they would be paid based on their output and et cetera, et cetera. Well, now those have all been shut down. And a lot of those organizations are struggling to even figure out if they're going to be able to survive. And so if you care about the developmentally disabled, that's a population that you can get directly involved with and understand who are the organizations and how can I help and what can I do? Um, you know, the, the, the ability to use technology and social media and, you know, add that kind of connectivity and capacity to a lot of organizations that are doing things that you would care about is a huge opportunity to get involved. And one of the things I try and do in this organization, we have seven AmeriCorps uh, volunteers right now working in National Corps. You know, I'm constantly trying to make sure that we have plenty of people that are much smarter than I am and much more facile with the tools that are out there today um, because otherwise we're not going to be relevant and we're not going to be effective as we go forward. And so plenty of opportunity to get involved, volunteer, get behind something, um, figure out how the system works and then fix it. Love it. Yeah. And, and our friend, Jonathan Parfrey, who's the vice chair oh, yeah. and you are the chair of the BizFed Institute, um, you know, obviously with his organization, Climate Resolve, very similar of attacking problems locally, which actually have global impact. And it sounds a lot to like what you're saying is like kind of like hyper focus in on something that's tangible that you can make sense of that you care about and then get behind it. Right. And then if enough people do that, you actually have the opportunity to make global change or, or national change or regional or whatever that is to you. Um, so I'm, I'm glad to hear uh, synergies uh, on the solution there as well. Um, so I know we're kind of running up against time. Um, I know you're involved with, you know, you founded the La Jolla Institute, co-founder at the Outwork Consulting Group. We mentioned the BizFed Institute. Um, anything else that our, our audience um, should know about, like the type of work that you're doing? I think the, you know, the fighting against the nat natural tendency towards, you know, specialization. And, you know, I, you know, I as you said, I was originally going to be an architect, ended up as a city planner. And so city planners are designed, they're trained to think about the community as a system. And so I think that's something that I'm increasingly encouraging people to do is really take a step back and think about the community as a system and identify the ways that you can bring different parts of the system together. 
and back to the local government. I think that's the only way local government's going to survive is that they effectively build relationships among other agencies and determine how can we work together, you know, smarter, more effectively. And most people, this is going a little bit counter to what I just said as far as getting involved, get involved with something specific you can sink your teeth into, but understand your community as a system. And so, you know, ask the question, you know, how, why is this community here? How does it work? Why are these businesses here? Why, you know, why are these businesses succeeding and these ones are not? You know, how, you know, how do these things work? Um, you know, one of the great things that would be great for your audience that I always encourage is uh, most people know the 10 largest employers in their community. Who are the 10 fastest growing employers in your community and why? Why are they there? Why are they growing? And if you can start understanding that kind of a dynamic, that can give you real insight into your community about what is, what is going on in your community and what opportunity does that present for you? You know, one of the biggest challenges I think we have coming forward is the economy is going to be fundamentally restructured. It was already in the yeah. process. I think this is putting you know, accelerant on the restructuring. And so for a lot of people that can create fear and uncertainty, but it's also going to create a lot of opportunity. Yep. And so be open and look around and identifying those opportunities um, because they're going to be all over the place. I have no idea if I answered your question. <laughs> you did. You did. No, it's great advice. And, and it brought up another point too of how interconnected everything is. Like you can't talk about homelessness without talking about the economy and the healthcare system, which leads to housing, which leads to education. And like, it's all connected. Um, and, I, and I don't know that that's so easy to realize until you lock into one of those pieces and then start understanding the next piece. So I think the advice of seeing seeing your community as a system is, is smart. I think that's great. And I think people just need to get their their hands dirty and, and really just do it, right? Which is always easier said than done. But, um, you know, people are going to be itching to really get involved in their communities again after being locked up for so many months. So maybe this is our opportunity to do that. Well, that's kind of our time. Um, really fascinating conversation. And I'm, I'm I learned a lot and I'm sure other people will as well. And, and I think that this is probably the, the beginning of many other conversations we will have. Um, but I appreciate you taking the time and being with us today. Absolutely. Thank you, Aaron. Great job. You got it.